Thank you for inviting me to join this important forum. This is such a timely topic, especially coming so close on the heels of the climate convention in Glasgow, COP26, where there was clear acknowledgement that there is no viable route to limit global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius without nature. While we had hoped to see more action that matched the urgency of the moment, the COP26 decision text nonetheless represented an important step forward, spelling out the role of nature and the ocean specifically in addressing the climate crisis. A healthy and resilient ocean is essential as we build our climate mitigation and adaptation toolkit. At WWF, we were pleased that the COP26 outcome called for an annual dialogue to strengthen ocean-based mitigation and adaptation action and to integrate ocean-based action in existing mandates and work plans of the UNFCCC. Let me highlight just one example. Mangroves were recognized as a powerful tool for both mitigation and adaptation, sequestering blue carbon and protecting coastlines. In the Asia-Pacific region, Indonesia, Australia, Korea, Fiji, and Papua New Guinea are part of the International Partnership for Blue Carbon that seeks to promote and preserve the climate benefits of blue carbon ecosystems, including advice on how countries may include blue carbon in their nationally determined contributions to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement on Climate. Financial instruments like blue bonds or incentives such as reduced insurance premia for investments in nature-based solutions like coral reef protection and restoration, are also quite promising. By investing in the recovery and protection of our ocean's ecosystems and biodiversity, and by better valuing and managing its resources, we can rebuild the resilience of the ocean and the communities that depend on it. Valuing and managing ocean resources go hand in hand because what gets measured gets managed. So it's worth reiterating, the overall asset value of the global ocean has been estimated at about $24 trillion, providing annual goods and services worth at least $2.5 trillion. Yet the ocean is suffering from increasing impacts from climate change and unsustainable development, undermining its capacity to continue to provide those essential goods and services that support millions, even billions of livelihoods secure food and protein for over 3 billion people, and offer critical coastal protection. By 2050, it's estimated that the global annual cost to coastal urban areas of rising sea levels and extreme weather events will top $1 trillion. These same rising sea levels and extreme weather events will cause the displacement of many coastal communities, along with the destruction of precious biodiversity. The scale and urgency of these challenges calls for a transformative global response, a set of integrated solutions aimed at halting and reversing ocean degradation will contribute to the delivery of the Paris Agreement, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, and indeed the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. So far, ocean-related climate finance has tended to focus on blue carbon from coastal mangroves and insurance against tropical cyclones. These are good approaches. Blue carbon in the form of seagrass meadows, mangrove forests, and salt marshes can be even more effective carbon stores per unit than tropical forests. Mangrove restoration alone could save an estimated $65 billion a year in terms of storm and flood damage. And if lost or destroyed, 15 million more people a year could face catastrophic flooding. But ocean financing needs and opportunities are far broader, particularly with respect to nature-based solutions for climate mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. Public and private financial institutions need to extend the current focus of climate finance to incorporate blue economy-related risks and to more explicitly include coastal and marine investments that can provide climate benefits alongside benefits in conservation, food, and livelihood security. For example, building links across policy and planning processes can help embed commitments to decarbonize, conserve nature, and ensure sustainable development within both terrestrial and marine environments. This means aligning goals and targets for inland and coastal development with financing for habitat protection, restoration, and climate mitigation. When done in concert, This approach can help reduce carbon emissions and increase carbon capture, as well as foster adaptation to climate change for both people and nature. 
many new and growing maritime sectors, such as offshore renewable energy, aquaculture, or shipping, put pressure on those doing spatial planning to unlock the use of sea of the sea while reducing the risks of conflicts with other users and avoiding harm to marine ecosystems. We need tools capable of providing more complex impact assessments at an ecosystem level, factoring cumulative impacts across borders and sectors. We do see indications that policymakers are now focused on more holistic and integrated approaches to marine and maritime policies, such as integrated coastal zone management, ocean zoning, and ultimately marine spatial planning. Integrated marine spatial planning can also provide the long-term development framework that is more likely to attract patient private capital. So what is standing in the way of greater investment in a sustainable blue economy? The ocean represents higher risks in the form of regulatory gaps and inconsistencies, significant data gaps, capacity challenges, complex tenure and access arrangements, in addition to the lack of transparency and capacity to monitor, control, and survey huge tracts of oceans. And while the ocean contributes substantially to national economies, very little of that economic value finds its way back into protecting and restoring the ocean's natural assets, addressing regulatory and data gaps, or assisting coastal communities to develop environmental, social, and economic resilience to climate change. Despite these challenges, the blue economy is gaining interest from financial institutions, with trillions of dollars expected to be targeted at ocean and coastal development over the next decade. The risks of a business-as-usual approach to this increased investment are becoming more evident, not least to the insurance sector, facing the impacts of climate-related events on coastal infrastructure and to investors encountering a declining resource base due to overextraction. We should therefore focus our attention on better understanding, better pricing, and then minimizing those risks. Our new report, Navigating Ocean Risk, Value at Risk in the Global Blue Economy, helps identify and quantify blue economy risks. Together with our partner, Metabolic, we developed an innovative new model that uses systems thinking to incorporate blue economy-related information into a traditional value at risk model. It helped us find that investors in about two-thirds of listed companies are collectively at risk of losing $8.4 trillion due to declining ocean health and climate change if business as usual continues. This publicly available tool and data set enables asset owners, investors, insurers, governments, and financial regulators to assess ocean risks in portfolios, identify potential stranded assets, and pivot to climate resilience, climate resilient investments, and business models. In fact, the model shows that potential losses could be reduced by more than $5 trillion by meeting the commitments of the Paris Agreement and transitioning to a sustainable blue economy. For example, coastal real estate and infrastructure, which are emissions heavy and often destructive to to ecosystems and fisheries, are also the blue economy sectors most vulnerable to the physical risks of climate change. Action to mitigate impacts by reducing emissions and preserving natural systems that protect against storm and flood damage could reduce value at risk for these vulnerable sectors from almost $4 trillion to less than a $1 trillion. Sensitive industries like fisheries and aquaculture likewise would benefit from mitigating pollution, biodiversity loss, disease transfer, and erosion of natural habitats. These actions could reduce value at risk for fisheries by almost a trillion dollars and for aquaculture by almost $3 trillion. Beyond the matter of better understanding ocean-related financial risk, there remains a significant funding gap. Put simply, too much money is channeled toward business-as-usual practices that are degrading critical natural capital and not enough money is targeted at protecting, restoring, and sustainably managing our ocean's natural assets. Over the last 10 years, $13 billion of philanthropy and overseas development assistance was invested in sustainable ocean economy activities. To put that amount in context, it's been estimated that the impacts of climate change on the ocean could cost an additional $322 billion a year by 2050. Climate finance also falls far short of what is needed to keep global warming within one and a half degrees Celsius 
And in 2018, only 8% of all climate finance went to nature-based solutions, with only a fraction of that funding targeted at oceans. Both governments and financial institutions should significantly step up their commitment to invest in solutions across the ocean climate nexus, in particular, to support nature-based adaptation, investment, and strengthen resilience in least developed countries and small island developing states and facilitate the transition to low carbon economies. They need to scale up financing to projects that work across climate and ocean solutions. And this should include a broadened remit to finance nature-based solutions for coastal resilience and climate adaptation and utilize incentives to finance climate smart fisheries and marine protected areas. This is particularly timely following the commitments by, for example, the UK and French governments to earmark 30% of their overseas public climate funding to nature-based solutions and their call to encourage other donor countries to channel more climate finance to protect and restore nature. The ADB's Healthy Ocean Commitment provides an excellent example of how to support ocean health and resilience with its focus on creating inclusive livelihoods and business opportunities in sustainable tourism and fisheries, protecting and restoring coastal marine ecosystems and key rivers, reducing land-based sources of marine pollution, including plastics, wastewater, and agricultural runoff, and improving sustainability in port and coastal infrastructure development. Again, this isn't just about reducing value at risk. Blue carbon and the vital sequestration services that coastal habitats provide are excellent reminders that building with nature can generate triple bottom line benefits for climate, nature, and people. Our window of opportunity to avoid the worst effects of climate change is small. To make the most of it, we need clear and practical ways to finance, implement, and evaluate nature-based solutions linked to the oceans and coasts. This includes ensuring that the role and benefits of blue carbon ecosystems are incorporated into national mitigation and adaptation strategies and supporting countries to strengthen ocean-related measures in their nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans. The multiple benefits that these kinds of nature-based solutions can deliver can help leverage a growing pool of public and private finance linked to sustainable blue economy approaches, such as the ADB's own Action Plan for Healthy Ocean or Pakistan's Green Stimulus, which includes ocean and coastal nature based solutions. Additionally, financial institutions like the Global Environment Facility and the Green Climate Fund can offer incentives like concessional loans and grants to encourage such approaches, but crucially, member countries must ask for them. Strengthening ocean-related measures in nationally determined contributions therefore holds great promise for public, private, and blended finance. WWF would like to see all financial institutions follow the leadership of the ADB by adopting the Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Principles, which WWF and partners developed to ensure that the sustainability and inclusivity were at the heart of the blue economy. We're delighted that these principles now form the basis of the UNEP Finance Initiative Sustainable Blue Economy Initiative and also include sector-specific guidance to help secure the long-term health and resilience of the ocean and the well-being of the communities that depend on it. Other important efforts include the emerging EU Blue Taxonomy and the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. When fully adopted and implemented, these frameworks can help guide future finance toward the most sustainable development pathways. Governments must help incentivize this critical shift. Far from being a trade-off, pursuing ocean and climate solutions together and integrating climate and ocean finance strategies opens up new possibilities for for delivering the Paris Agreement and indeed the Sustainable Development Goals. Blended finance solutions will significantly support this transition, using public sector or philanthropic finance upfront to strengthen the enabling conditions for more capital to flow into the sustainable blue economy and disincentivizing business as usual investments. I've talked about the need to properly value ocean assets and to break out of siloed thinking in terms of ocean finance versus climate finance. But one of the biggest challenges ahead is that there are simply insufficient scalable and investable opportunities available to attract blue economy capital. 
many sustainable ocean economy projects and enterprises, particularly the smaller enterprises that are prevalent in the global south and east, lack the appropriate deal size and risk return ratios to attract available capital. This means a lack of a successful deal track record and market data, which further reduces investor confidence. Capacity constraints are also a barrier to these businesses becoming investable. WWF and partners have been working in the Southwest Indian Ocean, in the Mediterranean, and in the Coral Triangle to identify portfolios and investable projects to amplify and accelerate the uptake of locally led solutions to protect and effectively manage coastal and marine resources. We are now looking at opportunities to develop regional incubators and accelerators that can scale up this effort. We're also about to embark on an initiative focusing on blue forests, mangroves, seagrass meadows, salt marshes, that will assess investable portfolio opportunities and sustainable financing approaches for these critical habitats. We hope this will be an important contribution to addressing this significant finance gap. We very much look forward to collaborating with ADB and others to further develop innovative solutions that directly tackle the impacts of climate change and ocean biodiversity, providing direct benefits to the world's most vulnerable coastal communities and indirect benefits for people everywhere. With that, I want to thank you again for inviting me to join you, and I wish you successful discussions on this critical topic. Thank you. Thank you.